so thanks so much um, to everyone for um, you know joining us on a somewhat sunny evening here. Um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about uh, my research and sort of where things have led me um, in terms of the situation in Canada as well. It's kind of going to be an all over the place uh, presentation. Uh, you can find me at Save Wild Bees on Twitter, uh, bees.yorku.ca or my website, savethebumblebees.ca. Um, and a, a project that I'm involved with called Finding Flowers. Oh, I'm actually gonna turn off my camera just to help with the um, internet for a bit. So just interrupt me if there's any issues. Uh, so I started working on wild bees in 2003. And this graph here um, goes from 2003 to 2021. And it's the number of publications about pollinator declines. And when I first started studying um, bees, not too many people were interested. Very few people across the world were working on this, but ever since um, it's steadily increased and it continues to increase um, every year. A lot of people are worried about bees and uh, rightly uh, also the ecosystem services that they provide. And there have also been some really um, high profile studies about the decline of, of insects um, that have had people um, become more concerned. Uh, there was this study, what year was this? I wanna say 2000, yeah, 2017. Um, and this was in Germany across 63 protected areas um, that found insect biomass had declined drastically by over 75% um, in almost 30 years. These are protected areas that hadn't been destroyed by agriculture or urban areas or what have you. They might've had some invasive species and, and other things, uh, issues with climate change. Um, but this is really, this is one of the most shared studies that year and um, people got really worried and are still really worried about what's going on with insects. So I've been working mostly on wild bees, um, focusing mostly on bumblebees, although I've worked on other bees as well. Uh, one of the things I did uh, with the Xerxes Society and other organizations was uh, working with the IUCN Red List to um, assess the North American bumblebee species. So there are about 250 species of bumblebees in the world and about 50 in North America. Um, and what we came up with after these analyses was that about a quarter of our bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. Um, so this is just a small portion of our, our native bees, the bumblebees, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but it gives you a sense that um, some species are declining rapidly, some more slowly, and there are some species that are either lacking in data, so we don't know, um, or are remaining common. So often when I say I work with bumblebees, people are like, oh, come. I have tons of bumblebees in my yard or my garden or what have you, but that's kind of like telling like an ornithologist who studies, I don't know, pileated wood woodpeckers to come see the pigeons or whatever uh, that happen to be um, in a given spot. I'm interested in the diversity of bees, having many, many species around um, and specifically focusing on species that are at risk of extinction. In addition to assessing species, my lab also looks at what might be the threats to wild bees. Um, we've done work in collaboration with Amrozayat's lab also at York, looking um, at genomics to help answer some questions around this. Uh, we've looked at climate change, pesticide use, habitat loss, um, and all sorts of other things as well. And even though I'm a trained ecologist, I've realized that um, I have to deal with people in order to get things done. Uh, so my lab is very interdisciplinary and we work with um, apple growers, with other farmers. Uh, we've done surveys to, to examine public, the public's awareness around bee declines. Um, it was mentioned that I helped run Bumblebee Watch, the community science program um, that's um, been pretty successful in the US and Canada. Um, and a few other things. Um, I work closely with NGOs and government agencies as well. So you may have heard of the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. It was the first bee that was in, uh, listed as endangered, both in Canada and the US. Um, it is currently listed as endangered. It was in the 70s and 80s, uh, the fourth most common species in Southern Ontario. So if you saw 100 bumblebees in the field, it would have been 15 of those bumblebees, 15% so of a bumblebee community in the summertime. Um, 
these black dots are where it was historically and the white squares are where it was more recently found. So there remain to, um, some populations in the Midwest, um, a couple in the Appalachians. Um, I found it in Piney Provincial Park in 2005 and 2009. Those are the last two known records for all of Canada for this species. Um, and it's pretty much disappeared um, through much of Northeastern US and Southern Ontario. And the only thing that really explains this loss um, over this short amount of time is an introduced disease. So now that we've lived through a pandemic, we can see how awful a novel pathogen might be if it's something that um, the species has not co-evolved um, resistance to. Um, so that's really the only thing that we think happened here. We think that um, a disease was brought in with the managed bee industry and uh, knocked them out, except for um, some populations here in the Midwest. So even though bee declines continue to be very popular amongst the public and politically palatable, uh, we actually haven't done too much in terms of protecting pollinators in Canada if you look at actually the government um, actions. So uh, the rest of Crash Bumblebee was assessed as endangered in 2010 after I wrote the CSIRC report for it. Um, but even now it still doesn't have a final like uh, management plan drafted. So this is more than 10 years later. Um, so species can go extinct while things are being worked on at the bureaucracy level, I guess. There are other species that are listed on the Species at Risk Act that are not um, protected in any way. They don't have recovery strategy. Um, there are species that COSIWIG has assessed that are not yet listed. And then in Ontario, the pesticide and species at risk legislation um, are becoming, are getting weaker. Um, but it's been really interesting to study this topic where no one cared <laughs> when I first started working on it. And now people are decorating their Christmas tree with it. There's protests, there's all sorts of things going on. Uh, there's this Facebook question by National Geographic that said, if you could dedicate your life to saving one species, what would you choose? And 14,000 people responded and the top winner was the bee, um, which is a far cry from when I was you know, younger and people were wanting to save uh, tigers and I don't know, other things, pandas, things that are a little bit larger, I think. Um, but it just goes to show you how things have changed. One of the most complicated uh, things is that um, as a conservation scientist, I'm most interested in the con conserving native biodiversity and species at risk of extinction, but that problem is often conflated with um, the livestock management of the European honeybee in North America. Uh, so people think that the honeybee is in decline, uh, that we need to support them. And it's true that there are issues around managing honeybee hives, like they can be exposed to pesticides, then you know, the beekeeper needs to get a new hive and it costs money and all these things. But honeybees are not at risk of extinction. They're one of the most common insects around the world. They've been introduced to many places. They're feral in many places <laughs> uh, where they're non-native. Um, and so this is a completely separate issue from the kind of thing that, that I deal with. And as public awareness and popularity of bees has, um, grown. Uh, there are other things that have also sort of increased. Uh, one of them is the number of European beehives on roofs of buildings. Many buildings want to do something that sounds sustainable and adding a beehive seems to be uh, something <laughs> that they can easily do. Uh, but that of course adds uh, non-native species and competition and new diseases. Pretty much every honey beehive has some levels of diseases that they just kind of maintain at low levels. Um, and many of these diseases are things that our native pollinators have not co-evolved with. Um, even NGOs were um, celebrating the honeybee. Uh, you can go to Costco or Canadian Tire and buy these bee condos, which are also a bit questionable in terms of uh, their value. Um, this uh, flow hive thing that happened, it was like a GoFundMe or whatever. These people raised millions and millions of dollars because they sort of sold it as a, as a hive that was less um, hard on bees, that it was like more gentle. 
So people are really throwing money at this problem and it kind of is veering away from where um, our attention needs to go if we actually do want to uh, save declining pollinators. Um, in 2013, one of the first things that Kathleen Wynne did in Ontario was start this pollinator um, policy. And it was a really uh, big learning experience for me. Um, obviously, it was the first time that like a provincial government um, was interested in my <laughs> research area. Um, and it also got the most public support for any environmental issue. Uh, 52,000 people wrote in about this on the Environmental Bill of Rights Registry. Um, up next was maybe the cap and trade changes that Ford made, and that was like 20,000 something, and the spring bear hunt, which is also like around 20,000. So there's never been an environmental issue that got as much public attention as uh, this pollinator policy did. Um, it was a bit um, focused, actually it was completely focused on honeybees and neonicotinoid pesticides, uh, both of which are not like the main issues around bee declines um, here in Ontario, um, but it was kind of like the dominant narrative, especially if you were listening to things from Europe. Um, so that ended up being uh, one of the things that was focused on. Um, and the people who wrote in, over 97% of them were um, in support of saving bees, protecting bees, and the environment um, ecosystem services they provide, but it was clear that the policy was not based on um, evidence scientific evidence. And then even though this was so supported across um, the public, um, in the end, the lobby groups, which were the grain farmers um, and a couple other farming organizations, um, ended up having a lot of power. And what ended up being, being the final policy probably didn't change anything in terms of neonics or anything else um, for the long term, unfortunately. So um, yeah, it was a bit of a, <laughs> just a disappointing experience, but um, an interesting one to live through. My master's student, Allison Nichols, uh, went through um, and tried to figure out why people were so interested in this topic. Uh, so 90% of the comments written in were just those form letters that come into your email that say click here and then sent. Um, like I said, most people were in support, um, but when she went through the non-form letters, um, she found that only eight uh, people actually referred to any peer-reviewed science in their comments. Um, so that's really a small number when you're thinking about 52,000 uh, comments submitted. In terms of what people were talking about, in Ontario we have um, 800 species of bees um, and about three quarters of the people just said the word bees, so we're not really sure what they were talking about. Uh, just over 20% either said honeybees or implied honeybees and just over 5% uh, uh, mentioned any other bee, uh, like a bumblebee or a solitary bee or what have you. So again, a very small portion of, of that. One of the things that ended up happening uh, with this was that there became this like uh, pretty big divide, um, sort of urban versus rural, farmers versus city dwellers. Um, there was a lot of like um, sentiment that people don't know what it takes to like, you know, be a farmer these days and how hard it is and what have you. Um, and that unfortunately is not a good place to be when we're trying to work on pollinator con uh, conservation because the reality is that farmers um, are allies. And most of the times in this work that my postdoc uh, did with, with apple growers, um, far farmers want to be able to help um, defining uh, bees or help support wild bee biodiversity. Um, and it's just a matter of, you know, having financial incentives or having more knowledge or education or what have you. Uh, so that was one of the unfortunate um, consequences of, of, that, of that policy. It kind of burned some of these bridges, which we know would be, are very um, important to move forward. One thing that I wasn't really expecting was to be as a conservation scientist in conflict with NGOs. Um, I still find myself in conflict with NGOs, mostly because they um, are promoting um, the conservation of the honeybees a lot of the time, including this uh, very recent campaign by UNESCO with Angelina Jolie, uh, where they like are introducing 2,500 hives into bio reserves across the world, including places where honeybees don't exist, or at least Apis mellifera doesn't exist, um, and using the products to make makeup for Guerlain and, and all these things. It's very, there's a lot to 
there, <laughs> um, but I just wasn't quite prepared uh, to find myself with all of these sort of enemies on all sides. Um, with a PhD student, uh, Mr. Nessa Van Bison Trip, uh, we and with Friends of the Earth Canada, uh, we commissioned a poll to understand what Canadians were understanding around bee declines. Uh, so about 2,000 Canadians were um, called on the phone across the country, um, and some de demographic information was taken. Um, and then we also had specific questions that we were asking. So uh, none of this was surprising, but it's good to sort of have a sense. Um, but about half of Canadians think all bees are endangered. And um, I mentioned before that only a handful of species are actually listed as endangered, or yeah, it's really only like three at the moment. Um, so it's definitely not all, uh, most of them have not been assessed. And many species actually remain quite common or are actually naturally um, expanding their ranges like the uh, carpenter bee. Um, more than half of the people surveyed thought the European honeybee was a wild and native bee, and two thirds were unsure if this one um, non native species could replace wild bees um, in terms of pollination services. Only one of the 2000 people um, surveyed was able to name a solitary bee, and the vast majority of people thought pesticide use in the flower. Uh, the loss of flowers were the most important threats, which for the, the bees that I uh, study is not um, really the case. It's more introduced diseases for managed bees and climate change, which are probably more important issues right now. So this is what it feels like a lot of the time. Um, people are really interested, they're on board, but a lot of the stories are uh, just wrong or uh, de detracting from what needs to happen in order to actually make the solutions. I think we see this a lot with like climate change, with COVID. It's like we have the solutions, but we can't get enough people to like get there <laughs> in terms of moving towards what we need to do. So there's a lot of reasons why we should conserve our wild bee species. Um, I'm probably speaking to uh, people who already know all this, but um, in terms of agriculture, um, we know that the honeybee cannot replace our native bees. Um, when we have cross-pollination by many different bee species, fruits tend to be um, larger, heavier, more symmetrical. Um, if there's an issue with colony collapse disorder or American fowl brood or whatever, it's nice to have those wild, wild bees as insurance policies uh, to go out and pollinate the, crop, the crops. Um, and some bees um, can buzz pollinate. So things like tomatoes and blueberries and cranberries um, actually require this different behavior uh, to be pollinated, which honeybees cannot do. The other thing is that um, many of our native bees have obviously co-evolved with the weather here and they don't rely on the sun like um, honeybees do. So you've heard of the honeybees doing the waggle dance uh, with the angle of the sun and then they tell all their friends where to go and forage. Uh, but bumblebees, for example, memorize landmarks on the ground so they can actually go out and uh, forage and pollinate on cloudy days, which is like most of our spring. And when many of our fruit trees um, and berry crops are in bloom. Um, we need to conserve our wild native bees uh, for climate change. We've known for many decades now that the more species you have in a system, the more resilient that system is if you disturb it. Um, and climate change is going to disturb things. Um, when you have things like, you know, spring storms and you can see the blossoms um, freeze over, um, it's a good visual representation of what's happening. Uh, but also um, when you have species that come out in the spring and in the later spring and in the early summer and later um, in the summer and in the fall, uh, you have kind of, um, this buffer against these extreme weather events. Whereas if you just had a few species in the system, you wouldn't have that, that uh, pollination service happening. And of course, climate change is an actual threat to wild pollinators. Um, other things that are not really talked about too much is um, that we need our wild bees for food security and indigenous sovereignty. Um, not everyone has the time, the space or the money to have their own beehives and to uh, procure their own pollination services. Uh, many people in cities, for example, have community gardens that just rely on um, 
um, wild bees to do most of the pollination. And when you bring in honeybee hives, we have no idea over time if that reduces bee communities or changes bee communities over time. Um, we do know now that diseases are being transmitted and that's very, very worrisome, uh, but there are definitely consequences to this. So having those wild bees in the system is really important for food security, um, also for indigenous cultures. Um, the native plants here have um, co-evolved with the native pollinators and they have long-term relationships with important medicine plants and food plants. Um, and these can't just be replaced by something like a European honeybee. Uh, so we have this project called Finding Flowers and it's in, uh, um, led also by Lisa Myers, who's another faculty member in my faculty and Dana Prieto, who's our research associate. And uh, the idea for this is for me as a scientist to start thinking about other knowledge systems and trying to understand where this disconnect is happening in terms of people just you know, thinking we can manage pollination systems by bringing in European honeybees um, and thinking that they might be able to replace these, um, you know, thousands year old <laughs> relationships between um, plants and insects, but also people and land. So uh, we're doing this um, using art and science and uh, co-creating knowledge at these different places, um, these different gardens um, to understand better the situation. Um, and this uh, is called a biocultural approach, and there's been a lot of work done in other systems, including caribou, um, where, um, for example, my colleague Jean Pulpis has worked with the Dene people to understand species diversity and behavior of local caribou populations based on uh, traditional knowledge systems. So for finding flowers, it's um, inspired by this Mi'kmaq artist, Mike McDonald, who passed away in 2006. Um, he was a documentary filmmaker and he was making a documentary in Northern British Columbia about um, a land claim issue, about some forestry that was happening. And he, as he was interviewing the elders there, um, gets in territory, um, butterflies kept getting into his shots and he started getting really worried about butterflies, um, especially if the, the logging was allowed to happen. And the elders there told him that um, the butterflies were their ancestors. And if you ever feel ill, um, you would follow the butterfly to get to the medicine plant that you needed to help your um, illness. And when you think about the things that we drink in tea, things like echinacea and peppermint and chamomile, um, what else do we drink? All sorts of things. Um, many of these are um, insect pollinated plants. Uh, so it's a really interesting sort of way of thinking about things. So these are where he um, planted butterfly gardens. And his idea was to go across the country and plant native gardens, so very local um, native plants to each one of these um, locations um, to sort of communicate um, a bunch of different things, but we're still learning about why he did what he did. Um, but he was talking about, you know, reconverting the land back to providing um, medicines and, um, um, you know, habitat for butterflies um, and that kind of thing. So these are where we, we know that he did uh, put together butterfly gardens, but there's only one remaining, which is at Banff um, Center for the Arts. Um, and people often don't realize that it's an art installation and that it's a garden because it looks like this, um, which isn't exactly what people think of as a garden most of the time or an art piece. Um, so we've been replanting some of the gardens. Lisa has been out east and out west this summer because a lot of our things were put on hold. Um, but these are some examples of ones that we have in Southern Ontario at Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery in the Woodland Cultural Center. Um, and you'll see that there's stuff that blooms early in the spring, like strawberry and things that go all the way late into the, um, the fall, like aster and uh, goldenrod. Um, so he knew that he had to support insects all the way through the growing season. He also knew that you needed to have host plants for the butterflies as well as nectar and pollen plants. That's something that people often forget. They love the butterflies, but they hate the things eating the leaves of the plants. <laughs> um, and yeah, so really thoughtful um, selection of plants in all of his gardens. 
Um, so in addition to replanting these gardens and making them places to share knowledge, uh, we're also learning more about pollination systems for important um, medicine plants um, or food plants like the Three Sisters Garden or Common Bearberry or tobacco. Um, so we're doing kind of experiments on that to understand these relationships better. Um, so I'll just mention a few ways um, if you wanted to help um, declining bees. Um, I know uh, the most common things that are suggested are, of course, to plant native plants, which is always great, not just for bees, for all wildlife. Uh, but there's some other things uh, to think about instead of just installing a bee condo or putting a honey beehive on your roof or what have you. Um, so Bumblebee Watch is actually one of the best ways that people can help us. We're looking for um, populations of rare species. Um, so we have a free phone app, or you can use the website, which is bumblebeewatch.org, if you need to upload from your camera instead of using a phone camera. Um, and this has been um, really useful for a variety of reasons. Um, I had a PhD student, Victoria McPhail. Um, she recently, I think, wrote a little blog for you guys, and her research looked at how community scientists have um, contributed to our understanding of wild bees um, over time. And she found that if you look at the data sets that um, scientists collect, which are the first two graphs, um, they do have more coverage, um, but if you add Bumpley Watch, which is the green graph, um, we do get a lot more eyes on the ground. And that's really important when we're looking at things like just um, changes in relative abundance and trying to find if species are moving, uh, shifting their, their ranges and that kind of thing. Um, so it's been extremely helpful to receive these photos from people, even if people don't know what they're sending us. Um, so um, here's another example. So for uh, bumblebee watch, there's a common species called the common eastern bumblebee. It's one of the most common species. And um, the historical range is this blue area. Um, so what we thought it occurred in, but with photos from um, Bumblebee Watch, we now know it has either been introduced or is naturally spreading outside of um, this historical range. It's definitely been introduced to BC um, using green, um, from the greenhouse industry, um, but there are other places now where it's popping up. So in addition to locating rare populations, we also use it to, uh, track movement of common species as well. Uh, so that's just some examples of how these data are being used. If you do want to um, help us out, um, we also use these data for peer-reviewed publications, looking at threats. Um, we're also um, collecting baseline information around which plants are being used, where they're nesting, uh, what time of year the queens are emerging. Um, and we do landscape studies in terms of uh, looking at pesticide use, and climate change, and that kind of thing. And then the data is also used for government reports like COSIWIC assessments and um, COSARA assessments. So other things you can do um, is talk about bee diversity. Based on our survey, um, most Canadians have no idea that we have 865 species. Um, and that some are at risk of extinction and that the European honeybee is not one of those. Um, most people don't know that our native bees are mostly solitary, that they most, mostly live in the ground. Many of them don't sting. Um, actually the most common um, coloration of our bees is actually metallic -y silver or green, not yellow and black stripes as you would think. Um, none of our native bees make honey because they sleep over the winter, uh, so they don't need to store food. Um, and most of our bees don't live in hives, just the bumblebees do. So there's a lot of misinformation around bee diversity. So really encourage you just to talk to your neighbors and observe things as you're walking and just sort of get a feel um, for our native uh, bee diversity. Um, of course, planting native plants is always a good thing, not only for bees, but for birds and all sorts of other critters. Um, and we also especially ask people to think about um, planting things that uh, bloom early, like shrubs, um, and that go later into the fall before. Um, that's kind of like the last chance that, that pollinators have to uh, build up their fat bodies before they hibernate for the winter like bears. Um, so restoring high quality habitat is important, but also protecting the high quality habitat that we have available already. Um, it's really hard to replicate things that mother nature has been working on for hundreds of years. 
Uh, so really trying to maintain and protect um, those, those um, high quality habitats is, is priceless. Um, I'm also trying to think about pollinator gardens as in sort of different ways. It doesn't only have to be like your front yard if you own a house, um, but thinking about also community gardens as pollinator gardens and medicine gardens and other ways that people can support native biodiversity that, that work for all sorts of demographics and uh, would be interesting and fulfilling for all sorts of people. Um, and then think about fighting some of the larger systemic issues. So, you know, protecting the green belt, thinking about climate change, all of these large uh, political things. I wish I could tell you that just buying a e condo for $12.99 at Costco will solve all of our problems, but unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. Uh, so we need to think a little bit bigger and we need to get political if we really want to save the bees. Um, in terms of uh, planting, if you Google a flower patch for the rusty patch, we did this with Wildlife Preservation Canada. Uh, we also have a new book out with Lorraine Johnson. Do I have a copy here? Somewhere. Here it is. Oh, I'll show you after because my camera's off. Um, about gardening uh, for um, native, creating na native habitat for native bees. Uh, another important thing to do is to be aware of bee washing. So whenever you see someone spreading misinformation or um, you know, things that, you know, support non-native invasive species or uh, including seeds. Uh, so often those pollinator seed packets include non-native <laughs> invasive seeds and people think that they're helping by throwing them into their ravine systems and what have you. Um, so yeah, just being aware of all of this and pushing back wherever you see it. Um, also being aware of simple solutions. Uh, those of you who are involved with, you know, land trusts and understand um, ecology a little bit more probably aren't as um, susceptible to the kinds of messaging like, oh, if you just let your dandelions grow for May, like you're going to help the bees or if you just wait for temperatures to be uh, over 10 degrees for three days, then you can do all your, your yard uh, cleanup and not harm anything. Uh, the reality is that insects are using leaf litter and old twigs year round. Uh, like I said, we have some species that don't emerge until this later in the summer. Um, some emerge first thing in the spring and then they go into hibernation like three weeks later. So um, keeping things messy is always a good thing. Um, and there's no simple solutions to help the species that are in decline, unfortunately. Uh, so this is the um, a couple pages from the book that I'll show you in a second. It's available from any major bookstore or online. Um, and uh, we try in this book to communicate some of the complexity around supporting native pollinators. Uh, we're dealing with hundreds of species. We're dealing with um, hundreds of plants, hundreds of pollinators. We're dealing with large threats, um, we're dealing with complicated humans. Um, so we hope that we try to talk a little bit about this nuance and complexity in a way that people might understand, not to mention the fact that we're talking about you know, thousands of years of evolution as well. Um, so there's a lot in there. Um, so it's something to check out if you want to think a little bit further about these things. Um, so with that, I will take your questions and turn back uh, my camera on. Thank you. That was full of a lot of really interesting information. I appreciate that. Um, looks like we have a, a question. Um, oh, no, just pumped for the new book, especially as it <laughs> was done with the legend that is Lorraine Johnson, many thanks. Yeah. And Thank you know you. what, actually, Lorraine was registered for tonight's event, but it doesn't look like she was <laughs> able to make it, which is too bad. So agreed. <laughs> and maybe actually, I should reach out to Lorraine and see if we can get a signed copy or two and, and Sheila maybe you you could sign it as well and we could use that as a as a prize or a giveaway or something so yeah all right any anyone else if you have any questions please feel free to to type them in the chat um while we're waiting to see if any others come in I actually have a question from a colleague he wanted Dan wanted me to ask you he doesn't feel like he is seeing as many pollinators this year as he say did last year. Um, a, is that actually true? And B, is there a reason why that may be happening? Um, 
I'm not too sure. <laughs> okay, we fair enough. Obviously, won't have the data for a while, but yeah. um, sometimes it's just a matter of having like a single hive close by. So like a single common Easter bumblebee hive is 200 workers. And if they can forage within, you know, 500 meters, they will prefer to do that because it saves energy. Right. Um, so it could just be as simple as like one hive not being there that was there in the past. Um, but okay. like I said, I'm more interested in diversity. So um, if you could actually start your own little uh, bumblebee collection on Bumblebee Watch, and then you could see from year after year um, if you have all the species um, returning to whatever place you're looking at, um, that would actually be helpful for science as well. <laughs> okay. So again, back to the making sure you're submitting these kinds of observations to, to the citizen science portals. Perfect. All right. I am, I'm not, no other questions yet have come through in the chat. Oh, here's one. Can the Bumblebee Watch app be used without actually identifying the species ourself, i.e. if you just submit the photo? Yep. I've had the app for some time, but we'll admit I have yet to use it. Yeah, so it filters based on your location what the possibilities are, so you can guess. Um, but you can even just select unknown, and then we'll go through it and identify it so whenever we have a chance. There's a bit of a backlog, but we do our best. And is there anything like, would you, like, a lot of people are getting into iNaturalist. I know I'm, I'm one of them. Um, is it better to use the Bumblebee Watch or are there portals or I don't projects in the in the iNaturalist for Bumblebee Watch itself? Um, we've kept Bumblebee Watch separate because we make sure the data is like um, high quality. So we can use it for scientific papers and uh, government reports. Okay. Um, we do sometimes pull if there's a cool um, finding in iNaturalist, we'll definitely include those records. Um, but in general, because anyone can identify things on iNaturalist and um, insects are so hard to identify, <laughs> yeah. uh, we find that it's better for us to just like keep it so that um, our records are identified by experts okay. or verified by experts. And, and then we have a data set that's a little bit more um, useful in that sense. But I mean, use whatever you will use, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything is better than nothing. Okay, yeah, and Jason just followed up to that. He said, thanks, I will watch the intro guide to the app after this call, <laughs> so there you go. And he's gonna keep asking questions, so please do. Um, top picks for early spring and late fall plants uh, for native bee species. Um, yeah, so good question. It really depends where you are. Um, so for the late fall, definitely like the asters and goldenrods, and there are some goldenrods that are a little bit less invasive, Canada goldenrod that people generally don't like. And of course we have to remind people that goldenrod doesn't cause allergies. That's ragweed and they bloom <laughs> at the same time. Um, in terms of top picks for early spring, like um, especially with climate change, things like, like early blooming trees and shrubs are probably the most weather uh, tolerant. Um, there are of course spring ephemerals that come up in, in the forest understory that are also really important plants. Um, but um, we've come to think of like spring flowers being like crocuses and daffodils and tulips and things that are actually like not, um, you know, native <laughs> to Southern Ontario at all. Um, and that's because a lot of our spring blooms are in trees and people don't notice them as much. Uh, so like things like uh, service berry and Eastern redbud, and, um, all of the like early fruit, like prunus trees and, and apple trees and all of those like you know, different types of cherry trees and what have you. Those are all really important early spring forage. And um, I would say that just planting one tree is much more valuable than letting dandelions grow on your lawn for, you know, the month of May or whatever. Um, <laughs> there's a lot more flowers on that one tree than you'd probably allow dandelions to take over. Um, so yeah, that's just basically just try to keep in mind trees and shrubs as options for the spring. Okay. Um, is the Toronto area good for all southwestern Ontario in the app? Uh, so the app will, um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but the app will filter to wherever you are. So if you're in a, another part of Ontario, it'll just show you what's um, what's there. It's not just based on, on what's in Toronto. I don't know if I read that question correctly. 
but in general, all of Southern Ontario has the same um, bumblebee species, now that I think about it. All right. Yeah, I got, oh. One more thanks, really appreciate the reference to Indigenous food sovereignty as part of this conversation. Yeah, I'm learning a lot from Lisa, so if you ever get a chance to listen to one of her talks, I definitely recommend it as well. Um, if you follow Finding Flowers on Instagram or Twitter, we try to share them. Um, she has currently um, an, ex an exhibit up at Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery, um, where she's curated some art on this topic as well. Good to know. Right. Well, see, we'll give we'll give it one more minute. See if any final questions come in. But I guess if if um, if there aren't any more, we can we can thank you again, Sheila, for your time this evening and the fantastic presentation. And um, it was recorded, so I don't know how to do editing, but I will find someone, <laughs> and, and hopefully sooner rather than later, we'll we'll send out the link. To, we'll upload it to YouTube, and we'll send out the link to everyone. And then I know there were some people who weren't able to attend, so we'll make sure that they get a copy of the presentation as well. So. So I, I, yeah, nothing else has come in. So I, I guess we'll we'll call it an evening. And yeah, thank you, Sheila, once more for for your time okay. and for that great presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Have thank a you. good night. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye.